I'd like to welcome you to the 34th annual uh, W.E.B. Du Bois Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, this series has been going on, obviously, for a number of years. Uh, and during that time, we've had uh, an illustrious cast of presenters. And this evening will be no exception. At this point, uh, we're waiting for the gospel choir to come in so that we can formally begin. So as soon as they do, then we will proceed with the program as printed. Thank you. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Let every voice and sing. 
At this point in our program, I'd like to uh, ask attorney James Wiggins to come forward and do the presentations for the second generation scholarship. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. All right. I thought at first I was going to have an opportunity to speak behind the podium, but I guess that's just for the keynote speaker and not for just an attorney and alumni from UMBC. I left UMBC in 1975, and in 1987, we formed the Second Generation Scholarship Fund. It was a group of students or alumni who decided that they wanted to be involved in UMBC and to offer scholarships to deserving students. We have the normal requirements for, um, for, for applying for the scholarships, but we do require one thing more. We require that you take an Africana Studies course. And the reason is this. When we were in school in, in the early 70s, UMBC was not as welcoming to African American students as they are now. And it was a struggle for us to succeed here. And there was only one place where we could turn to receive the support, but also to receive the, the, um, the to receive the belief that we could make it at UMBC, and that was the then African American Studies Department, which is now the African Studies Department. That was where we went to find out that we did belong. We belonged at UMBC, and we could succeed. And the Second Generation Scholarship Fund, we're honored to be able to appear at this event each year to present our scholars. Uh, we have two recipients this year, and both of them, they are not your traditional, well, they are great students, but they didn't follow the traditional course in coming to college. Each one of them is a single parent with two children. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was in college, the obstacle of being a parent and raising children and still doing well in school might have been a little bit too much for me, but not for these two individuals. The first student is Dante Henson. Mr. Henson? Now, Mr. Henson, I want to make sure I have this correct, is a health administration and policy major, and he's minoring in Africana Studies. He is a vice president of the Africana Studies Council of Majors, and during the year, in addition to being a father and raising two children, he's also a mentor to um, African American youth to try to help them achieve what he's now trying to achieve. Uh, we need a lot more individuals like uh, Mr. Henson. Uh, Mr. Henson uh, has served in organizing an event recently on campus where Congressman Elijah Cummings came to speak to um, students on campus. Uh, he's doing great in school. I wish I had done as well when I was in school. <laughs> and we want to um, provide Mr. Henson with some incentive and some help in, in, in continuing his schooling here at UMBC. Our second recipient is Octavia Brown. Now, Ms. Brown is majoring in social work and she's been dedicated to human service profession, I guess for a long time. <laughs> this can't be right, the number of years, right? <laughs> well, she's been doing this for a long time. 
But she is a member of numerous honor societies at UMBC, including Phi Theta Kappa, Chi Alpha Epsilon, Phi Kappa Phi, and the Golden Key International Honor Society. She's currently carrying a 3.9 average. In addition to, in addition to serving her community and volunteering um, with the House of Ruth, where she finds the time to do all that she does and um, maintain her grades, I don't know. But we do want to congratulate her on her efforts and also to provide her with a thousand dollar scholarship to us continuing her education. Now, before, before I take my seat, I just want to tell you, the students, that I believe it's important that you do take some type of um, social um, studies, history type program. A lot of us here are just in the sciences, but you need to have something to round you out. This, the social sciences will make you a better professional in whatever discipline you might want to enter. You don't want to be um, just a rigid person without any sense of humanity and community. And I, I suggest to you that one of the best places to go to receive this additional um, <coughs> training, as you will, will be the African Studies Department because they will provide you the nourishment that you need to move further along in your efforts. When you leave UMBC with your degree, you'll be able to compete with anybody anywhere. I believe that. You can compete with anybody on any level, anywhere. But you also want to be a well-rounded professional. And I suggest to you that you do look to the social sciences and that you take on a few courses to make yourself a better person. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay. At this time, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker for the evening, Dr. Horace G. Campbell, teacher, scholar, activist. Dr. Campbell holds a joint professorship in the Departments of African American Studies and Political Science at the Maxwell School of Syracuse University, where he also serves as the director of the Africa Initiative, a campus-wide project promoting scholarly interests in African affairs through interdisciplinary exchange and scholarship. In addition to his duties at Syracuse, Professor Campbell has also taught international relations at universities in China and Tanzania. And he did mention to me earlier this evening that he's trying to get back to China for a while. <laughs> he likes it there, apparently. Presently, he teaches courses on African politics, African international relations, militarism, and transformation in Southern Africa, as well as introductory courses on African American studies and Pan-Africanism at Syracuse. His research interests cover a wide spectrum of issues relating to the black diaspora. Included among these are topics such as issues of peace in the 21st century, which of course he will be sharing with us this evening, uh, particularly as that relates to the United States, reconstruction in Africa, China in Africa, Pan-Africanism and reparations, and US foreign policy and Southern Africa. Based on such topics, he has written and published uh, numerous books. Among these are Roster and Resistance, From Marcus Garvey to Walter Rodney, Reclaiming Zimbabwe, The Exhaustion of Patriarchal Model of Liberation, Pan-Africanism, Pan-Africanists, and African Liberation in the 21st Century, and most recently, uh, which he allowed me to take a look at this evening, Barack Obama and 21st Century Politics, a Revolutionary Movement in the USA. In connection with these topics, he's also published uh, more than 40 journal articles and dozens of monographs and edited book chapters on such topics. In addition to being a distinguished teacher and scholar, Professor Campbell has also pursued a notable career in community and public service. Such activities have included as I, the aforementioned director of Syracuse's Africa Initiative, but also being an activist for peace in the greater Syracuse community, being a board member in terms of the Syracuse Peace Council, contributed to numerous major newspapers in the United States, Southern Africa, Caribbean, and the United Kingdom, as well as being a radio commentator on, uh, for Pacifica Radio. Dr. Campbell was educated in the Caribbean, Canada, Uganda, and the United Kingdom, receiving his doctorate from Sussex, Sussex University in the United Kingdom. So without further delay, I present to you our admirable community activist, teacher, and scholar whose career path and reflects the tradition of W.E.B. Du Bois, Professor Horace G. Campbell. Good evening. It gives me great pleasure to be here. And when we were talking about coming to speak here this evening, my brother, who just introduced me, told me that this was the 34th, 34th annual W.B. Du Bois lecture which makes it a tradition, and I would think an honorable tradition. It gives me great pleasure to be with you this evening at this moment. I want to thank the citizens of the state of Maryland and the students of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, the faculty and staff for inviting me to share with you our concerns about the moment in which we live. This is a moment of great opportunities. It's also a moment of major challenges. 
And like W. Dubois, we seek to fall back on those who went before us. And so we are looking tonight to look to what Dubois has taught us so we can seek inspiration and harness those energies so that we can create new energies for the 21st century. And I dare say we are going to need them today, this week. It has been a week of celebration for most citizens in the United States of America. It is a week of celebration because it comes one week after the alliance of black people, brown people, women, workers, youth, gay and lesbian activists, environmental justice activists. They've just registered themselves one more time in re-electing Barack Obama. And so this is a moment. Yes, I think we should clap. <laughs> there should be no hesitation about why this is an important moment, not only for citizens of the United States of America, but for citizens of the world. This election was historic in many ways. It demonstrated that the techniques of organizing in the 21st century could reach persons using new forms of targeting people that in the past the corporations thought only those who were selling goods could do that. This election demonstrated that with proper mobilization and organization of people, that the conservatives who seek to dominate the airwaves and they seek to dominate what is said and what is acceptable, and it's amazing to me, after the election, a week after the election, you can still see Newt Gingrich on television. <laughs> I wonder what he has to say that they put him up there and those kinds of persons. But despite the domination of the media by the conservative forces, we have shown that there are other resources within the community of ordinary persons that can be mobilized. History will also point out the ripple effects of the election. When you throw a stone in the river, it's not just where the stone lands, but the effects. And we're beginning to see the effects of this election and the attempt of the citizens of the United States to participate in a new process of democratization. This is important because the citizens of the United States would like to liberate themselves from the ideas and chauvinism that propelled the United States into a 10-year war in Afghanistan a war of destruction in Iraq. And although you do not hear this on the news every day, there is an ongoing war against the people of Somalia, against the people of Libya. And it is that war against the people of Libya that has brought to the full force of the United States public this what they call scandal involving the head of the United States Africa Command. What you have not heard in the news is that on October 18th, Carter Ham, who was a general in charge of the United States Africa Command, was relieved of his job. And on November 9th, General Petraeus resigned. And Admiral Gauche was relieved from the John Stennis fleet in the Indian Ocean. What connects all these three things? All these things are connected by the fact that there were some sections of the United States military that wanted to make policy about deployment of forces 
outside of the direct control of the executive of the United States. That we have these so-called command structures that have established bureaucratic and military integration to the point that they think they could bypass the civilian leadership of this country. And so the change in the Africa Command for us in the global peace movement is not enough. What we, as part of the African peace movement, are calling for is a complete disbandment of the US Africa Command. We do not, let's, let's say it, yes, don't hesitate. Why should, if you want to go and do work in Africa, why should it be mediated through the US military? You're actually endangering the lives of researchers when you do that. So this is the moment of opportunity. And so when I was invited to come to speak on November the 14th, 2012, at UMBC, I deliberately chose a topic on peace. Because I deliberately did, did that because I knew at this moment we would be embroiled in a war. And if Barack Obama had not been reelected, the war that is going on against the people of Iran would even be more intense than what it is right now. So I want to thank Professor Robinson, the Africana Studies Department. I want to thank those faculty members who we spent the past two hours having dinner with. I'm glad to be here. There are so many distinguished persons who have presented this lecture. And of these persons, I want to mention two of them. I want to mention Professor Ron Walters from the University of Maryland, who followed the traditions of Dubois in ensuring that his scholarship was relevant, his scholarship was meaningful, and his scholarship transcended his own life. I want to mention Professor Manning Marable, who passed away last year. These scholars, along the, among all those who came to give this lecture, they joined the traditions of Du Bois, who W. Du Bois, in the 95 years that he traversed this space, this material space that we inhabit right now, he ensured that for most of his adult life, he put forward ideas about self-determination, the dignity of human beings, self-determination of states and societies, and for this, one had to fight against the idea of racial domination and racial hierarchy. So he was an anti-racist leader. Du Bois lived for a very long time. And I'm sure most of you knew from the history of Du Bois, born in 1868 in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. He joined the ancestors in August 1963. And in the 95 years that he lived, he witnessed and saw the destructiveness of so many wars. He was but a child when the United States was coming out of the great divide where Africans had to push the society to fight a war so they could become human beings. One of the most important books that Du Bois wrote was on that period of history in the United States, Black Reconstruction. And if you have not read that book, I would recommend it to you because there he did something that was fundamental in analyzing the history of this country, the way in which Africans in the United States of America pushed the society to the point where they had to fight a war about the decision about human beings. At dinner, we were discussing this movie tonight, this movie that is coming out by Spielberg, 
And there was a review in the New York Times, I think, yesterday of the movie. And from the movie and from the narrative of the movie, I'm told that African Americans appear to be voiceless without historical agency in that movie. If you want to see the agency of African Americans, I think you need to go and read what Dubois wrote in this major book, Black Reconstruction. Dubois lived through that war that was supposed to be the war to end all wars, World War I. He lived through the start of World War II, which started in October 1935. Many people do not know that World War II started October 1935, when Ethiopia was invaded. And in fact, we saw the activism of Dubois after that invasion in October 1935. They warned the world, watch out. What's happening in Ethiopia is going to happen in the rest of the world. They did not pay attention. And the real world paid a very high price. Dubois lived through World War II. He lived through the Korean War. Dubois understood what the real causes were. And so what is not usually talked about is Dubois's role as a peace activist. So our discussion of the war and peace would have to raise the question, what does peace look like in the 21st century? In the 20th century, when Dubois was in the Council on African Affairs, with Paul Robeson, it was very clear that you cannot have peace with racism. You cannot have peace with colonialism. So what is the response of our generation to racism. What is our response to military invasion? How do we see what's going on in Libya today? I am arguing in my new book called the NATO's Catastrophic Failure in Libya that the intervention in Libya is like October 1935. And so, how will we respond to what's going on in Libya? Why are so many Pan-Africanists silenced by this narrative about terrorism, about Islam, and about Arabs? And how is it that we have internalized a narrative about Pan-Africanism that excludes people in certain parts of Africa? The war was a Pan-Africanist. And at his time, Pan-Africanism was defined in, real, in relationship to how peoples of African descent could have common interests and unite to struggle for freedom. I want to propose that today, the struggle for peace, freedom, is inextricably tied to dignity, not just of Africans, but of all human beings. So if I do not get to the end of my presentation, I want to tell you what this presentation is going to say. That the fundamental challenge of the 21st century is how we can be human beings. It's a simple proposition. How can we be humans in the 21st century? It is a proposition of this lecture, that the technological changes of the 21st century promises to dehumanize us in a way that is even more fundamental than the forms of dehumanization that Dubois and our ancestors saw. And so the challenge of the 21st century, the challenge of the Americas, the challenge of peace, the challenge of reconstruction from Argentina in the South to Nova Scotia and Canada in the north is how can peace, democracy, environmental repair, and social transformation be placed on the agenda so we step back from this era of darkness 
that we still live in. This era of darkness that is called development. This era of darkness that is called progress. This era of darkness that is called individual responsibility. And this era of darkness that is called growth. How do we conceptualize a new concept of dignity and humanity in the 21st century? These are the challenges that I think we can take from Dubois. Because there's so much that has changed since the, ti since the time of Dubois. What Dubois has left for us is that scholarly activism that says that your work must be relevant. What has changed from the time of Dubois is that the world economy has fundamentally changed. That the engine of the world economy has now been located in a new area of the world. China, Korea, Japan. And we now know that that is temporary. Because those who are making projections about the world economy understand that the dominant economy in the next 15 years of the world is going to be in Africa. And they look at the trajectory trajectory of what are the strengths of Africa. And they look at the four top strengths of Africa to see that trajectory. First, the demographic strength of Africa. It has a youth population. Secondly, and this is what they're understanding the era of nanotechnology, the cognitive skills of Africans that are more developed than in any other continent because what was considered backward in the past is now being harnessed in the era of robotics. Thirdly, the revolutionary traditions of Africa because Africans have come through this period of anti-colonialism. Fourthly, the massive resources of Africa, especially the genetic resources that has been harnessed and preserved. And when you add to that the dynamic technological changes and the mobilization and politicization of the African youth, we are into a new period. And because those who project power for the next 10, 15 years see these developments for Africa, Africa must be divided. And so there's a, scr there's a scramble for Africa. And so you have many countries wanting to sign agreements with Africa, China, Japan, Russia, India, Turkey, the United States, the European Union. Everyone is now seeking out Africa. But Dubois understood this. From the beginning, Dubois understood this. In the 1930s, Dubois wrote about in the 1940s, the world in Africa. Dubois saw what was coming. We are now there. We have the collapse of the European project. The European project is shattering, and the European working peoples are being challenged on two paths. Will Europe go to the path of chauvinism, concentration of wealth in a small section of the population, or will the European working peoples or reorganize the economies of Europe for the upliftment of the European peoples? The Europeans are being called on to have a new project. And we've seen that that project that believed in the old way of building Europe, invading Africa, plundering Africa, exploiting Africa, we saw them do that last year. And insofar as the United States of America joined into that project, we are complicit in that plunder of Africa. And it is for us in Africana studies, in the peace movement, wherever we live, to organize against the plunder and destruction of places like Libya. How is it that the United States and NATO said they were going to Libya under the responsibility to protect and well, Gaddafi was supposed to have killed about 500 persons. And more than 50,000 persons have been killed since the invasion. And that war is still going on. I'm opposed to Gaddafi. I'm completely opposed to Gaddafi. I have no truck for Gaddafi. 
but it's not for NATO and the United States of America to go into Libya and to remove Gaddafi, execute him, humiliate him as a way of trying to roll back African unity. So we are seeing the consequences of that in what they call the Petraea scandal. And what we have to do in Africana studies in the university, we have to talk about the networks that must link colonialism, plunder, military intervention, because Dubois was opposed to colonialism. And we still have colonialism in North Africa. We have colonialism in the Western Sahara. We have the Israeli form of occupation in Palestine. And so our networks must, must organize against these forms of colonialism. These forms of colonial domination are perpetrated through disinformation and psychological warfare against citizens in these countries. Citizens of Europe, citizens of the United States of America are told that they're embarking on humanitarian mission. Now remember, King Leopold went on a humanitarian mission to the Congo. And after King Leopold finished the humanitarian mission, 10 million Congolese were dead. So is it not time that we ask questions about these humanitarian missions? I think you're going to hear a lot more humanitarian mission because we are living in the midst of a major crisis. What is this crisis? Well, according to the newspaper, they call it a fiscal cliff. <laughs> and the words that they use is to divert us from the fact that it's fundamentally about political power. Because 1% of the population holds trillions of dollars, and they want to put the crisis onto your back. Now, there's a man called Paul Krugman who writes for the New York Times. And he came out with a book last year, and he said what most people do not want to say. Krugman says, end the depression now. That's the title of his book, end the depression. Because Krugman is saying, we are in a depression. Then if we are in a depression, what is a depression? How do you come out of a depression? There are some economists who would like to tell us that in the last depression, 1929 to 1945, we came out of the depression by rearming for World War II. So you come out of a depression by rearming for World War II. What was the cost to human beings all over the world of World War II? Are you then suggesting we will come out of this depression through another war? That is why the removal of those militarists in the United States is so important for us today. Because the educational system does not prepare us for understanding what happened in the last depression. And it was at the end of that depression that we had the massive barbarism on both sides of that war. What was that barbarism? The Holocaust. It was barbarism, but the Holocaust followed directly from the idea of hierarchy of human beings. What was the other barbarism? The other barbarism was the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki was a crime against the peoples of Japan. And younger peoples in the academy do not understand that as a crime. Many people do not understand that the most active time of Du Bois' life was in his opposition to nuclear weapons. After 1945, Du Bois devoted himself to world peace. He wrote numerous books and tracts, and he was the head of the Peace Information Center. He wrote the book, Peace is Dangerous. He wrote the book, 
I take my stand for peace. In the battle for peace, 1962, African battle against colonialism, capitalism, racialism, and imperialism. Du Bois, in these writings, suggested that you could not talk about Pan-Africanism without talking about peace. And he was very clear about this. He was also very clear about the fact that you cannot have peace with colonialism. And Du Bois, Kwame Nkrumah from the 5th Pan-African Congress in 1945, worked assiduously to raise the question of peace. And when he went to the San Francisco Conference in 1945, he wanted to place on the agenda of the United Nations an international declaration about self-determination for all peoples. And this came forward in 1960 in the United Nations Charter that said all peoples have the right to self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. What does the United States feel about this today? What do students feel about the fact that we have colonial territories? In the Americas, there are over 28 colonial territories. How do we support those people who are opposed to colonialism in Martinique, Cayenne, Guadeloupe, and all of those territories? Now, we are told that last week, the citizens of Puerto Rico voted to become a state of the United States of America. What has happened to the independence movement in Puerto Rico? How is it that in the 1930s, the independence movement in Puerto Rico was the largest political movement in Puerto Rico, but we don't know about that today? But this question of peace and colonialism, this question of peace and self-determination is bound up with what we learn and what we know, and where we put our money. So Dubois was acting as a peace activist against nuclear weapons. We're told today that really nuclear weapons is old news. That this is really ancient business. Last year, when Defense Secretary Gates was testifying before Congress about the US military capabilities, he did not focus on nuclear weapons. He focused on electromagnetic pulse weapons. It's a new kind of weaponry. EMP weapons that can close down all of your electronic he focused on how to project power through what he called the fourth dimension. He focused on new capabilities in space. He focused on cyber warfare. What he did not tell the people was about the capabilities that are called HARP, that is based in Alaska. What he did not talk about was the biological agents and the capabilities for biological warfare, and why the United States has not signed the international conventions on chemical and biological weapons. So we are more aware today of the experimentation that is going on with respect to biological agents. Some of you would have read the book by Harriet Washington, Medical Apartheid and the Experimentation on Black People. Some of you would have read about this doctor in South Africa that was trying to develop a virus to attack black people to leave white people. But that was last century. What about this century? What about synthetic weapons? Craig Venter who is a venture capitalist, said in 2010 that they discovered synthetic life. Who will have control over these scientists in the 21st century? 
were curtailed, has told us that we are in the era of singularity. This book is called The Singularity is Near. This is the name of his book. What is singularity? It is that moment when the brain-computer interface will create transhumans. And Rick Rosal said that we will get there by 2045. And that is why whenever we speak about peace in the 21st century, we go back to the Bois. We go back to Martin Luther King. Because Martin Luther King said, and I want to quote, a true revolution of values will soon cause us to question the fairness and justice of many of our past and present policies. A nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. How do we avoid spiritual death in the 21st century? How do we respond to physical death, not even spiritual death? That was the thesis of black reconstruction in America. 600,000 persons died in that war. 600 persons died because the society did not believe Africans were full human beings. And Du Bois understood that peace is not just the absence of war or the absence of armed conflict. Du Bois understood that peace is also based on the presence of social justice. And he knew that one could not, could not get social justice in the capitalist system. In 1915, at the time of World War I, Du Bois says, we then who want peace must remove the real causes of war. We must extend the democratic ideal to the yellow, brown, and black peoples of the world. So he's very clear. There can be no peace in the world until we end all forms of racial hierarchy. And Du Bois wrote, peace in dangerous, not for all folk, but certainly to those whose power and standard of living depend on war. And in 1951, he posed the question, must this way of life, actual or believed possible for a large majority of Americans, be defended by war, or is it seriously enlarged by peace? So this is the question I want to leave with you tonight. How could we enlarge our quality of life by peace? How could we reconceptualize the basis of society and the basis of the social organization that we are involved in? Many people do not know about Du Bois as a peace activist because within Africana studies, that period of Du Bois' life was when Du Bois was linked to the international socialist movements. That was a period when the government of the United States harassed Du Bois, took away his passport. So at the age of 93 years old, Du Bois joined the Communist Party of the United States of America. Now, some people want to be silent about this. They want to be silent about the relationship of Du Bois and Paul Robeson to international socialism. But Du Bois was very clear through his life. No universal selfishness can bring social good to all, he said. Communism, the effort to give all men what they need and to ask of each the best they can contribute, that's the only way to sustain human life. These aims are not crimes. They are practiced increasingly over the world. No nation can call itself free, which does not allow its citizens to work for these ends. Du Bois was not caught up in any black-white hierarchy. Du Bois was not caught up with the business about modernity. 
and so he was respected in all parts of the socialist world. Today, when there is this big propaganda against China, you should remind the people of the United States about the relationship between Dubois and the Chinese people and the Chinese Communist Party. And when the Chinese do something wrong, we should criticize them. But we should not go on any anti-Chinese crusade as some sections of the world would like us to do. So where do we go today in the peace movement? What are the challenges? One of the major challenges for us is the ideation system. The system of ideas about progress, about modernity, about enlightenment. Because these ideas are what present the fact that you can carry out genocide and you can call that genocide progress. So the United States was advancing to the West. And across the Americas, 100 million citizens were killed. And this is just collateral damage. That's just by the way. And World War I, Dubois wrote a little known pamphlet called the African Roots of War. He said to the peace movement, hitherto, the peace movement has confined itself to chiefly to figures about the cost of war and platitudes of humanity. What do nations care about the cost of war if by spending a few hundred millions in steel and gunpowder, they can gain millions in diamonds and cocoa? How can love of humanity appeal as a motive to nations whose love of luxury is built on the human exploitation of human beings and who, especially in recent years, have been taught to regard those humans as inhuman? Should you not discuss racial prejudice as the prime cause of war? That was in 1915. Why are we not discussing racism, chauvinism, Islamophobia as the prime causes of war today. No, we do not do that because the media tells our children that they can go to be humanitarians. And the integration between the media and the military mobilize our children that they should become members of non-governmental organizations to be the new humanitarian, the new missionaries. I remember earlier this year when most African Americans were mourning Travon Martin, the United States military came out with a video called Coney 2012. How many of you remember that? <laughs> Coney 20, they mobilized 100 million young people to sign up to call for the US military to go into Africa. So we were talking about how young people can be predisposed and pre-organized so for supporting warfare. We have to be doing better work. Better work so that we get to the heart of the matter, the conceptual problem. Sam Merriman, the African scholar, called on us to be audacious in responding to the capitalist system. Go on the web. And I ask you to read this article, Audacity and More Audacity. That's the title of the article, Audacity and More Audacity. He was drawing from the political work of the Occupy Wall Street movement to say we must socialize the means of production because at present, Wall Street socialized the losses and they privatized the gains. We must end the model of society where all the wealth go to 1% of the population in the society. So the conceptual question about who are human beings, the conceptual questions goes back to the heart of Western European thinking. Because Aristotle says humanity is divided into two. 
And that idea of Aristotle goes through Western European thinking from Hobbes to Locke to Kant. So when we read in political science about Hobbes and Locke and Kant and peace, we are talking about theories that dehumanizes other human beings. We have to have a new conception of humanity that brings together all human beings. How do we conceptualize citizenship? I want to end by talking about the last years of Dubois. 93 years old, he joined the Communist Party. 93, over 90 years old, he moves to Ghana. When he moves to Ghana, the president of Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah, who's sitting there to your left, calls on him to work on the African Encyclopedia. So he didn't say, well, at 65, I'm retired. At 70, he was mobilizing. At 90, he was mobilizing. So Dubois saw in his life work how it is that he must raise up the question of African unity. And it is the question of African unity, the unity of the people of Africa, that is at the cusp of the changed rural economy. Between 1800 and 1900, the African descendants were the dominant population in the Americas. Between 1880 and 1930, there was a wave of migration from Europe, genocide against Africans, to the point that in some countries such as Argentina, we hardly have an African population. And today, the African descendants in Latin America, coming out of the World Conference Against Racism, carrying forward the anti-racist tradition of Dubois, they are now mobilizing and organizing. And just as around 1880 to 1930, Europeans came to dominate Latin America because the changes in the world economy predisposed Europe to accumulate wealth from Africa so that Europe and North America became central to the world economy. We are entering a new period. And in that new period, the Americas must be linked up to peace and reconstruction and unity in Africa. And that's what Dubois worked for at the end of his life. And peace and unity and reconstruction in Africa will place Africa at the top of the world economy along with China and Africans and brown people in America. Those who project political power understand that. So after this election, you heard, we have to have a new policy on immigration. We have to go to the left of the Democratic Party in dealing with Latinos. Isn't it a bit late? <laughs> Wouldn't you have to rethink all of your ideas about the essentialization of what is a European? Is it not necessary to go back to people like Dubois to understand what's a human being in the 21st century? In the 21st century, we must step back from the ideas of development and progress. Hurricane Sandy was a small reminder. Hurricane Sandy said, you're having an election. You do not want to discuss the fact that the seas are warming. You do not want to discuss the fact that we have something called global warming. You call it climate change, but you have something fundamental when you're changing, we've passed the tipping point. So all over the world, we understand that we cannot have climate change without system change. And that's why we have to go back to W.B. Du Bois to take inspiration about how it is we can live in peace in the 21st century. I was very happy to see the young people singing. I was ha very happy to hear them call on us to lift your voice and sing. You cannot defeat people who lift their voices and sing. How could the Republicans win the election when Beyonce and Jay-Z was on our side? <laughs> what, 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 what were they thinking?
and they don't know that where that is coming from, there is so much more. <laughs> because the people were not singing for Barack Obama. <laughs> they were singing for themselves. When we had the conference for Man and Marble this early this year, Angela Davis said to us, if in 2008 we mobilized for Barack Obama, in 2012 we have to organize for ourselves. We saw it, why? They want to take away the vote. <laughs> they want to suppress the vote. They want to gerrymander. They talk about democracy, but they're against democracy because democracy is not for black people, even in 2012. So we mobilized and we organized. So the Republicans were defeated. But we should not stop there. We should organize and mobilize so we can hold Barack Obama accountable. We should organize and mobilize so we can stand up and beat back the hurricanes. We must reconstruct society in the 21st century. So there are four main tasks ahead of us for the 21st century. The four tasks are for us to move towards world peace, to speak about the health of human beings, the spiritual, the mental, the physical, sexual, and emotional health of human beings. The third task is that we need to have life. And I don't mean life that is virtual, like the avatars. <laughs> I mean people who really can breathe. And the fourth challenge is how do we repair the natural environment? These are the legacies that the war left for us. And we have to organize to live, fill those tasks. Thank you very much. Thank you.